Hi, this is Sophie Kravitz with Hackaday. I'm here live at the Hackaday Super Conference. I'm here talking with Catherine Scott from Planet Labs. Hi, Kat. Hi. <laughs> Are you having a good time? I'm having a blast, actually. Awesome. What have you been doing since you got here? Uh, well, I just came from outside. There was maybe some molten gallium that we were pouring on aluminum for fun. For fun, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what's happening. There's also like high voltage neon transformers melting, not melting, but burning through chunks of wood. So lots of interesting stuff going yep. on. I know we, we actually set up two fire extinguishers for that workshop specifically. And it also looks like there's a lot of people around watching. Yeah waiting for things it to smell, burn up. It smells incredible. <laughs> so you work at Planet Labs. What do you do there? So I'm the uh, tech lead for the image analytics team. And so what happens at Planet is that we have um, close to 200 satellites right now, and we're able to image the entire planet every day. So there's this basically huge constellation of satellites that is going around the Earth and catching the entire Earth at three meter resolution. And so all that, image, all that imagery comes down, it's close to, I think, 1.2 million high resolution photos a day. And so my job is to sort wow. through all of that data and drive insights that people can use. And obviously you don't look through 1.2 million photos by hand. No. We, How do you do that? We make software that does that. So we do a lot of deep learning, a lot of machine learning, and a lot of computer vision and AI. So what happens is, is that somebody perhaps has um, Say you want to understand the number of oil pads that are in uh, Russia right now because you want to understand how that impacts the commodity market. So what we can do is we can go and count all of those oil pads, see which ones have come into production, in the and, uh -huh. and as they come on to production, we can give you a count and say, well, today there were 192 oil pads in production, yesterday there were 190. And then we could probably do a model and say, like, we think this is what it's going to do in terms of oil production for this quarter. So who owns the area above the Earth? Like, how do you get permission to put 200 CubeSats uh, in space? Uh, well, so that's a regulatory issue. So it's a, it has to do with NOAA. And basically you say, hey, we're going to put up some satellites. There's some negotiation with NOAA. There's regulations to make sure that you, you do everything right. So mm -hmm. you can't have stuff coming down from space and hurting people. You can't have your satellites hitting somebody else's satellites. So you have to go and do some negotiation. I'm kind of removed from that environment, but I get to hear about it every day, which is cool. Do you, yeah, I realize you're removed from all of that, mm -hmm. but do you have an idea of how many CubeSats there are oh, total up, that, up I mean, in space? Thousands and growing quickly. So uh, I think it was February, we did a launch um, with the Indian Space Agency. Mm -hmm. We put up, it was the largest launch of satellites ever. I think it was over 200 satellites on a single rocket. Oh my God. And then of that, we were, I think, 88 satellites. So, so how does that work? The rocket goes up and what, do they just drop? the CubeSats off? Yeah, there's a, it's, like, it's sweet. There's a, there's a mechanism in the back of the, of the rocket, right? And mm -hmm. it gets up to orbit, and it basically just chucks them all out. There's a really sweet video you can go Google, and you just watch them, and they go pew, pew, pew. And then, they, <laughs> yeah, and then they, they hang out, they wake up real quick, and it's all, it, like that whole process is, is super cool because it's automated. Their wings pop out, they turn around, they start looking for signal, they phone home, and then we do a bunch of calibration, and they start doing this differential drag thing. So they started out as like a whole, clump together bit of satellites and they have wings and they use micro um, they use the the like micro atmosphere up there to uh -huh. slow down and what does they, that mean wait micro atmosphere so there's it's space but it's not completely space so there's still some particles so okay. you can you can kind of slow down and, and do what's called differential drag mm -hmm. and so they kind of slow down they um, spread out, and it's like a hula hoop going around the Earth from north to south, yep. and it goes around and around and around, and it's just basically a line. So it's at 10.30 a.m. local time, about, and this whole line of satellites just goes all the way around. We're, we're doing a lot of interesting maritime stuff right now, so we're, we're starting to look at how we can analyze ports and understand shipping traffic, understand... Um, where ships are, what they're doing, what they're shipping, what's coming off those ships, and how ports function, so we can understand um, sort of macroeconomic trends. Mm -hmm. and, and people are very, very interested in understanding how you know things come from China into the into the west coast of the United States, right. and how much, when, where, why, mm -hmm. and how it impacts global trade. So you must have a way to map X ship with oh, yeah. what is on that ship. 
Well, what we're really looking for is um, all of these big shipping containers and other kind of ca mm -hmm. container ships moving around and then when stuff comes off of them, like how many shipping containers were moved off that ship when. So what other kinds of data are you mining? Uh, we're really interested in agricultural data, uh -huh. so we can actually understand what crop types are being grown in what areas and potentially how healthy they are, whether they need more water. Um, so there's a very strong interest right now in precision agriculture. So if we can, well, the way I like to think of it is that we can image like all of Iowa. And if we can image all of Iowa and understand what subset of crops either need more fertilizer or more water, we can prevent people from indiscriminately um, watering or over fertilizing those areas. And even if it increases 1%, when you start aggregating that over an area the size of Iowa, it's, it has a huge impact. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the sort of flip side of that is if you understand what's growing really well, you can um, understand how those agricultural markets are going to function. Do, do other countries look for agricultural data from oh, you oh. or do they have their own uh, planet labs in another country well, so doing we, the same thing? We can distribute data all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not just the U.S. It is, it is Canada, it is South America, it is Europe, it mm -hmm. is Asia. Um, there's been some really interesting research coming out of um, Saudi Arabia lately because they're, I mean, you're trying to grow food in a desert, you're in an extremely constrained right. environment. And so they're very, very interested in being very precise about mm -hmm. monitoring their crops and understanding exactly what's going on. When you first started to mine data, or as you're doing it now, mm -hmm. do you, have there been any, like, wow, major surprises? Major surprises. Or things that are really interesting. I mean, it must look pretty neat to see a desert from space. Oh, so I, I think my, my favorite project, and I did this like a year ago, and it was just sort of like a weekend hack. It was, we have like an internal server uh, where we can go through and look through all the images. And I think I did this at just the exact right time. So we, it, it, we have like a like button internally. So we can go through all the images and you can just say, oh, that image is really cool. Or something happened like a volcano erupted or... Uh, there was a disaster, or the image was just beautiful. We get these beautiful scenes of like the um, South Pacific, and people just click like. And so I grab, you know, at, at some point we got enough of those, like a few thousand, and I built a neural net that basically looked at all of those and we just said, these are things that people think are interesting, and these are things that people think are boring, because uh, there's right. a lot of the earth that's actually really boring. You get these huge swaths of desert that nothing's going on. And we built this neural net and we deployed it in our pipeline and I can basically go and filter and say like, whoa, these are all the cool scenes, which when you have like, I don't even know the number we're up to, it's like 1.2 or 1.6 million images a day, you just can't look at all of them. Right. But if you can go and I can like run a query really quick and get the top 2,000 images mm -hmm. that day and I can just scroll through it. And be like, That's really whoa, interesting. Whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really cool. How many people work on your team that actually build the neural nets and the AI that uh, analyze this all these pictures we are 12 people and we're growing right okay. now so um, that's just my team and, and we're purely focused on analytics but there's um, there's Im image processing across our data pipeline so there's um, rectification calibration validation um, there's all these other teams that are like you know, we're processing probably more images than just about anybody. And there are this very particular, very cool subset of images that are just high resolution, multi-spectral space images, which are super cool. Korea is a pretty hot issue, North Korea specifically mm -hmm. right now. Are you looking at North Korea or South Korea? So, I mean, we, we at some point are just data brokers, but there are a couple groups in the United States that are particularly um, focused on using planet data to understand what's going on in North Korea. So there's been recent nuclear tests. You can actually, they've actually been able to say like, um, these are underground tests. And I, I believe like we're, these are not small nuclear weapons. They are very large nuclear weapons and they displace a large amount of, of um, earth when, when they are detonated underneath. And so there's a couple groups that have basically said, look, when we, we heard these nuclear weapons went off, we went and looked at all the satellite data, and you can actually see that all these mountains are shifting, Whoa. you know, and like, uh -huh. I'm pretty sure if we went and revisited them mm -hmm. a little bit, you could actually go look at the, at the trees and stuff, and they're probably not doing all that hot. Mm -hmm. And it really allows, I mean, it's one of the tools that is being used by the public to understand mm -hmm. what's going on in North Korea. Are there any other hot areas that you're looking at? Uh, well, there's always, I mean... Ones that you can talk about? Well, so disaster response has been really, really big lately. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, um, we, we have a disaster charter, so whenever there is a natural disaster, we're out there 
putting out our imagery mm -hmm. um, so that people can use it. And we're getting better and better about putting out analytic imagery for disaster response. So, so um, for the recent California fires. Recent Californias were a big one, um, and so we were we were looking in Santa Rosa, and I did a, a quick project where we were actually able to start getting um, there's a a couple of different uh, indices that we can actually just calculate straight off the the satellite data, and we can build mosaics and allow people to see. So internally, um, when there was the hurricane in South Florida, I have a bunch of family friends that are in right. South Florida, yeah. and then it was immediately like, can you see my house? Can you check on this? Can you check on uh -huh. this? And we're starting to get to the point where we can automate that process and get all that data out to first responders. Wow, that's that's pretty interesting. So what about, maybe this already exists, are there sensors, I mean, of course there are weather sensors on the ground, but say mm -hmm. like for California, mm -hmm. are, are there heat sensors on the ground that are communicating with the satellites so that we can predict the potential of a fire? I guess that would be more like well, a dryness, a dryness yeah, so sensor. There's, um, yeah, so there's what's called a normalized, it's a, um, normalized difference of wetness index mm -hmm. in DWI and so that's usually um, it's an indicator of soil moisture okay. and also um, you can look at like general plant health yep. using another indice mm -hmm. and so those indices can help predict these things there's also um, if you're if you're just generally interested in it, um, NASA has has the MODA sensor which does do low resolution daily imaging of earth and they have bands that are particularly tied to like analyzing um, smoke or different kinds of cloud cover. And so if you go and look at the MODIS data, you can actually see that like basically all of California was on fire <laughs> for all of the summer. Right, yeah. And it, it, it's, it's really, really bad. Um, I don't think there's on the ground sensors that we're using for tipping and queuing. What we're more interested in is understanding the data that we have and then yeah. maybe using it to do, we also have high resolution satellites. So we're very interested in understanding how we can use the lower resolution satellites to sort of automate the high resolution satellite data collection. So, well, what is your personal interest? Like what, what is something that you'd really like to look at? What do I really, really like to look at? I mean, I, I so we had this like um, cable competition at the beginning of the year. I, I'm very, you know, there's the economic um, things that we have to do and there's um, sort of agriculture. But, you know, satellite data is also really, really helpful for doing um, environmental monitoring, for doing conservation efforts. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, you know, in the free time that I do have and I get to play with data, I'm very interested in conservation. So, uh, like the, the Kegel competition, I specifically directed that towards understanding how... Um, how the imp uh, how the Amazon is changing and what's going on in the Amazon. So we built this massive data set. It's like uh, 50 gigs of data all through the Amazon, detailing all sorts of different phenomena from um, like fish bone deforestation patterns to illegal mining in um, in Peru to uh, uh, like there's different patterns of deforestation mm -hmm. too so sometimes people go and like selectively log and you can watch these little tiny selective logging roads appear and then trees just dropping down here and there and you can actually see it from space and then there's other just like crazy. well what's even crazier is there's stuff that like you didn't you wouldn't think that you could do at three meters but it actually happens these trees are so big that there's certain areas in the Amazon where um, like once a year, all the trees decide to fruit and flower, and you can actually see them fruiting and flowering from space. You can also see in like northern Michigan, you can see um, the, the leaves changing color. It's really phenomenal. We can do these time series now, which we've never been able to do this, where you go and look for four months, and you can actually see everything go from green to yellow and red to brown to like to nothing. nothing. Yeah. And it, it's fun. We've never been able to do those sorts of time series before, and it's, it's super cool. Cool. Well, thank you for being here yeah. today. Cool. Thank you.